we shouldn't attribute to states the personified notion that they have interests of their own or desires to maximize their own power or wealth or anything else. States are just vehicles for people to collectively accomplish things. And if what those people want to accomplish is better accomplished by cooperating with other states, by trading with other states, then that's what states will do. There's no third thing like a personified Leviathan that is pursuing its own interests apart from the interests of the people who make up the state. I'm Jack Goldsmith, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, February 14, 2024. Many international law scholars are skeptical about the efficacy of international law to shape state behavior and even international law's reality as law because it lacks a centralized hierarchical legislature, executive branch, or judiciary. In his new book, Law for Leviathan, Constitutional Law, International Law, and the State, Daryl Levinson of NYU Law School challenges this conception of international law by arguing that it is structurally similar to domestic constitutional law in its ability to constrain states and in its strategies for doing so. I sat down with Levinson to discuss the challenge of regulating the state through both international law and constitutional law, and what constitutional law theory can learn from international relations theory about how this happens. We also discussed how IR balance of power theory is like Madison's conception of constitutionalism, the implications for his theory for understanding how to hold states accountable for illegal action, and how to think about these ideas in light of the ostensible waning of state power in the modern era. It's the Lawfare Podcast, February 14, Constitutional Law, International Law, and the State. Daryl, the title of your book is Law for Leviathan, and it's basically about how law can govern the state. So let's start off with why why is the title Law for Leviathan? Okay. So Leviathan, uh, as everyone knows, is the creation of the great political philosopher, the first great political philosopher of the modern state, Thomas Hobbes. And many people uh, will have seen the cover image of Hobbes's book uh, entitled Leviathan, which is a drawing of a giant man wearing a crown and wielding a staff and sword hovering over the countryside. That's Leviathan. And Leviathan, in Hobbes's view, was such a powerful guy that the very thought that he could be subject to any kind of external constraints on his power, including law, was a non-starter. Uh, so Hobbes presented this problem a long time ago, which was, how can the state be made subject to law? Okay, and that actually divides into two questions. How can the state be subject to law at home? And how can the state be subject to law in its relations with other states? Fair? Correct. So the Hobbesian puzzle of how we could possibly impose law on the state has been solved. uh, And it's been solved in two ways. Uh, We have law for the state. Uh, We have a regime of law that governs the state from the outside, which is international law. And then we have another regime of law that governs the state from the inside, which is constitutional law. And so the project of the book is to show uh, that both of these regimes of law are equally law for Leviathan, and both have answered the Hobbesian challenge in similar kinds of ways. Okay, let's start with the challenge in the international realm, because I think the challenge is easier to see there. And I'll describe it and you can elaborate. The basic challenge is, is that states have relations to one another in anarchy. There's no authority over and above the state to impose law on them. There's no adjudicator or law enforcer over the state to, in effect, impose governance on them. And so the problem is, how do you create a legal regime without that superstructure, so to speak? Is that is that fair? Correct. It's the problem of, of law without government or law without a super state standing over the state 
capable of authoritatively telling us what law is and then enforcing law against subjects that have armies uh, and may not be inclined to comply. So there's always been and still remain a fair amount of Hobbesian skepticism about international law and what it can accomplish. International realists have always doubted whether powerful states like the United States are really constrained in any meaningful way by the rules of international law or international governance bodies like the UN. Like if we want to go fight a war, even if that violates the UN charter, we're going to fight the war because we're Leviathan and who's going to stop us? Yeah. And let me just, to sharpen the point, give a couple of examples in in the news. So this, Russia invades Ukraine, clear violation of the United Nations Charter, which is fundamental international law. And there's a war going on, and the West is supporting Ukraine in that war, but that's not executive enforcement from above. It's uncertain support. There's no international adjudicator to declare that that was a violation. And and there's been no international enforcement at the international level to to punish or push back on Russia for what it's done. So that's one example of how there's no outside governance, so to speak, to use a metaphor. And another one using the judicial example, we just recently had the International Court of Justice ruling on the genocide allegations with regard to Israel and Gaza. And the ruling was what it was, but it was a ruling that might shape public opinion in various ways, but there was no enforcement mechanism for it. Or at least if there is an enforcement mechanism, it's a very dim and distant one that maybe has to do with the International Criminal Court one day. But those two examples just highlight the difficulty of bringing law to bear on the state without governance, as you said. Correct. They're they're excellent recent examples of uh, why many people are skeptical about international law, what it can accomplish, whether it's really law. Yeah. So we're going to get to some examples later where where international law seems to be more robust and working, and we'll talk about why that might be. But let's do the comparison to constitutional law, because this is the surprising part for people. Your basic claim is, is that international law as law for the state is very much, or let me turn that around, that constitutional law as the kind of domestic law for the state very much suffers from the structural challenges of international law in the international realm. And this is counterintuitive because, you know, at least in in law schools, most people think of constitutional law as this really important, powerful body of law. And international law is this really weak area of law that some people question whether it's really law. And you want to analogize the two. Can you explain that? Sure. So, It seems like uh, exactly the same question as in the international case, who's going to stop the United States, a global superpower, from doing whatever it wants in the international arena in a state of anarchy with no super state to prevent it, as the question of who in the United States is going to stop the president as commander in chief of the armed forces from doing whatever he wants. So... When the United States uses force abroad, there are sometimes questions of whether we violated international law, and if so, so what? But at the same time, there are often questions of whether the president has violated American constitutional law by deciding unilaterally to use force without congressional authorization and possibly in violation of other constitutional rules. And I think we should be asking the same question of who's going to stop the president or to the extent the president is constrained by law, how is that working, given that the president has all the guns in in the same way that the United States has all the guns? So most people's intuition on the domestic realm is, well, we've got courts, and courts are these powerful things that control the executive in the domestic realm, and courts aren't as powerful in the international realm. Is that a meaningful difference? Well, it depends on what we mean by powerful, right? If we're talking about uh, how someone with a gun is going to be prevented from doing the thing they want to do, then the answer can't be that a judge holding a gavel is going to prevent that from happening. Courts don't have guns either. And the puzzle then just 
comes back around of why presidents as commander in chief of the armed forces are going to stand down when judges and justices tell them they can't do something. Uh, and in fact, they haven't in American history always stood down. So there are many famous examples of presidents daring the Supreme Court to stop them when they were doing things that they thought were urgently necessary uh, for the country. And that's not just presidents who are dubious lawbreaker types like Donald Trump. That's our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, uh, who was violating constitutional rules for the greater good of the country. And when the Supreme Court or individual justices rattled their gavels at him, he ignored them. Okay, but your claim is not that constitutional law doesn't work. Your claim is not that international law doesn't work. Your claim, if I understand it, is that to understand how these systems work, we should view them as similar through this, through, or at least through an analogous lens. So am I right that your claim is not to be deeply skeptical about the possibility of constitutional law? Correct. So the thing I want people to see is that however international law and constitutional law work, and to whatever extent they work in constraining powerful states or powerful political actors within states, it's not the way we're used to thinking about law working in state-run legal systems that apply to just ordinary people. So in state-run legal systems, you know, you violate the law, you're speeding, you commit a crime, and we have armed police who will come arrest you and stop you from doing those things. Uh, that's what we don't have in international or constitutional law. But that doesn't mean that those two regimes don't work. They just work in different ways. And we can talk about those ways, but I think they're basically the same kinds of mechanisms in international and constitutional systems. Okay, so before we get to these, I want to march through those, which is marching through the middle of the book. But just talk a little bit about how, you know, today we see, we're going to talk about these similarities. Today we see constitutional law and international law as very different things, unrelated things, sometimes even in opposition to one another. But it used to be people like Hobbes and a lot of the kind of classical thinkers about sovereignty and the classical thinkers about uh, international relations and some of the classical jurisprudential thinkers about the nature of domestic law, there used to be a tradition of seeing international law and constitutional law as the same thing, or at least as very similar subjects. And we've kind of lost that. Can you, can you talk about that tradition? Sure. So, so right. The, the idea of, of putting constitutional law and international law in parallel is a very old idea that goes back at least to Hobbes. And in that sense, is entirely unoriginal. And as you as you say, the more interesting question is why we now think any differently. I think we probably shouldn't think so differently about the two systems of law, but we do. So international law has been self-consciously grappling with the Hobbesian kinds of challenges for centuries. You know, how does it work without a super state to tell us what it is and to enforce it and the like? But constitutionalists have not seen themselves in the same predicament. To the contrary, constitutional law, at least in America, I think in other places too, has come to be understood as sort of real law, foundational to the legal system of the state, and not something uh, different, more like international law, trying to impose law on the state. And the question of how that divide opened up is uh, interesting and I think unresolved as a matter of intellectual history. It might have something to do with uh, judicial review. Uh, and as you suggested previously, the impression that somehow because we have courts deciding what the Constitution means in some authoritative way and in a sense enforcing the Constitution, that that solved the deep problems here, which I don't think it has. It may be ways in which international law has been denigrated or marginalized in some legal cultures, uh, including ours. But I don't think we know that full story uh, as of yet. So the project of the book is sort of to, to pretend that that divide never happened uh, and to remind us of what the legal world looks like if the two types of law are brought back together. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's talk about how law works, how how we can have something approximating law to govern the state, both in the external and internal realms, without a system of governance outside of it. So what are the basic strategies? So the strategy that doesn't work or exist is vertical, top-down enforcement by uh, a powerful super state kind of thing that has any kind of coercive power over over states or over governments, presidents. What does that leave? Well, the possibilities are well marked in international law and international relations. There's, to start, an ongoing strain of Hobbesian kind of realism, which is that you know international law does less to constrain state behavior than it might initially appear, uh, in part because powerful states set for themselves the international rules in many settings because uh, most international law requires the consent of states and states tend to consent to rules and institutions that serve their interests. So there may be less room for international law to interfere with states pursuing their interests than it might seem. But I think everyone, most people recognize that international law does in many settings actually shape and constrain state behavior. And I think it does so in two major ways. One is that it can serve the interests of states to agree to cooperate with other states through uh, regimes of law, because the reciprocal cooperation that states receive in return for their own compliance is worth the cost of abstaining from violating rules, even when it would be in the interest uh, of the state to do so. So that's institutionalism in international relations uh, as a tradition. And then there's another tradition in international thought, which is not based on an assumption of states acting in rational self-interest, but is the constructivist idea that law can shape the interests and self-image and internalized values of states in such a way as to make them want to comply with law in a broad system of international cooperation. So you just basically went through the three major theories of international relations, realism, rational choice theory slash institutionalism, or maybe regime theory and constructivism. And these are three different lenses on understanding international relations. And so one of the most interesting points in the book is you think constitutional law has something to learn from IR theory. And can you run through that? Sure. So I think each of these three perspectives on constitutional law and compliance is visible in constitutionalism and constitutional thought, though not as uh, self-consciously worked out as in international relations. There are constitutional realists. Uh, There have been constitutional realists since the founding. Madison and Hamilton were worried that constitutional rights and rules were going to function merely as parchment barriers, as they called them, that would not be able to constrain the politically powerful. And many people today continue to believe that constitutional law does less to constrain politically powerful actors, whether that's presidents or popular majorities, than it purports to. So uh, political scientists document over and over in various ways that the meaning of the Constitution that the Supreme Court provides for us or that's provided uh, by other constitutional interpreters tends to track the interests of popular majorities or prevailing political coalitions, so isn't actually a constraint on their behavior, but is just a projection of their own power uh, in many cases. Again, though, I think everyone who observes the uh, American constitutional system over time believes that there are a lot of cases in which constitutional rules uh, and rights matter and constrain uh, even the most powerful political actors uh, and force them to act against at least their immediate interests. And I think the explanations for that are the same uh, as the two prevailing explanations in international relations theory. So one is uh, a theory of reciprocity, you know, game theoretic ideas about uh, repeat play, uh, 
and rational interests. So if we protect minorities when we're in power, then our opponents will protect us when they're in power. And coordination ideas about how even if we disagree about what the right thing to do is politically, it's better that we stick to a set of shared institutional arrangements and decision-making procedures and democratic elections, because overall it serves our interests more to agree on those things, uh, even when they don't produce results that go in our direction. And then a kind of constructivist, idealist way of thinking about constitutional law, which is that the Constitution, the Supreme Court, is somehow legitimate and uh, exerts a kind of pull over political actors, leading them to want to comply with constitutional law just because it's law or law that was promulgated and interpreted through legitimate kinds of processes or to internalize the values that legal rules and regimes represent. Okay, so so just as in international relations, I mean, these are basically three competing theories, more or less, or three competing paradigms for explaining behavior in the international realm. And, you know, sometimes they're combined. One way of looking at these theories is they're different lenses on understanding international behaviors. And some of these lenses have more purchase in some contexts as an explanation than others. Is that basically the same, would you say, in, in explaining how constitutional law works? I, I think it's exactly the same. I think... I think there are contexts in which people, many people would gravitate toward realist explanations. I think there are contexts in which people would strongly resist realist explanations and insist that there was a lot of legal compliance going on and then uh, explain that compliance in multiple ways, depending on the setting. So one more question about this. Realism, Realism, depending on which stripe of realism it is, is not always skeptical of international law. But one thing it does emphasize is that you can't understand how international relations and maybe international law work without understanding power and the distribution of power and how the distribution of power informs subsequent equilibria. So no accident, for example, that the United Nations has uh, an exception, a veto rights in the Security Council for the five most powerful nations. Is there an analogy? Does it work the same way in con law? It, is, is the realist strand recognize that the distribution of power can matter in, in the d- devising the rules that govern the state? Sure, absolutely. So returning to the example of, of whether the Supreme Court interpreting the Constitution is a real constraint on the power of the presidency, a realist interpretation of a lot of Supreme Court decision-making would be that the Supreme Court does create constitutional rules uh, and decisions that presidents generally comply with, but the content of those rules and decisions is uh, reflective of the power of the presidency and uh, the coalition that supports the presidency. So the justices understand that they have to move constitutional law to a different place if constitutional law uh, is going to be complied with at the risk of the president or popular majorities just refusing to go along. Okay, and just one last question on this line, and that is you're focusing here – this is a question, not an assertion, because I don't know con law theory terribly well. The questions you're focusing on here really are how is constitutional law possible? And you're drawing on international relations theories to explain how con law is possible. First of all, is that right? And second of all, is this a question that's central to constitutional law theory, or are you trying to make it central? I'm trying to make it central. These these questions have been all central, as you know, to international law, international relations for a really long time. Uh, And these questions are much less often discussed among constitutional lawyers and constitutional theorists, somewhat more often by political scientists who are studying the constitutional system from the outside, but not to the extent uh, that these questions have been front and center in international relations, international theory for, for forever. So the questions are right about how constitutional law is possible 
starting with questions about who makes it, how is it enforced, and then how it works in different ways than ordinary types of law that the state creates. Uh, so there are ideas of balance of powers that are familiar to theorists of international relations uh, that have al- analogies in constitutional law, like the idea of checks and balances among the branches of government, uh, which runs parallel to the idea of balancing power in the realist sense among uh, different states. Uh, there are ideas uh, about the morality of state action and how we should assess state wrongdoing that internationalists have approached from various directions that constitutionalists have never been very self-conscious about. Uh, there are questions about how wrongdoing by states and governments can best be prevented and punished that are front and center in international law that constitutionalists have considered, if at all, obliquely and occasionally. Okay, I want to run through each one of those because all three of those things are all three of what you the elements you just described are interesting. Can you just say more about so in what balance of power theory is in international law, how it manifests itself in constitutional law, and what the shortcomings of of the balance of power idea might be in constitutional law? Sure. So as you know, the idea of balancing power from Hobbes to Henry Kissinger uh, has been central to the international realist view of of international relations among states. And the basic idea is that the peace and stability of the international order depends on the balance of power uh, between and among rival states. Constitutional law has developed in parallel a rather similar set of ideas. So uh, James Madison at the founding had a theory uh, of the design of the American Constitution that was based in large part on checks and balances between competing branches and units of government. The idea was just that, uh, just the same as that power seeking states keeping one another in check, Congress would keep the president in check and vice versa. Ambition would counteract ambition, as Madison put it. Internationalists, I think, have come to see that at least the crudest versions of realist theory are too simple uh, and sometimes misleading. The key insight there is that states aren't hardwired to compete or fight with one another, but often have reasons to cooperate in their mutual interests. So they trade with one another instead of going to war. And constitutionalists might benefit from following that same line of logic to appreciate that exactly the same thing is true of branches of government. So Congress and the president often cooperate or collude rather than compete in a checks and balances kind of way. And they do so when it's in the mutual interests of the people or parties who control the branches. So say more about that. And how does that idea tie into your your famous article with Rick Pildes on separation of parties, not powers? Tie those ideas together. Okay. So the... so. The separation of powers idea that most constitutionalists in this country carry around is that Congress and the president are rival branches, and each one is hardwired to aggrandize itself, to accumulate as much power as it can for itself. And the genius of our system of separation of powers is to pit these two branches against one another in a competition for power. Uh, And the result will be each will check the other and monitor the other and make sure it doesn't get too powerful or do anything too dangerous. And that way, the system will be sort of self-enforcing, which is a response to the recognition that there's no you know, super enforcer standing above the state. So you get internal enforcement horizontally uh, in this balance of power way, in the same way in the international system, you get horizontal enforcement by states against one another. The problem with this theory is that Congress and the president have no reason intrinsically to want to compete with one another for power. The People or parties who control those branches of government want to accomplish the policy things that they want to accomplish, but those things are not necessarily rivalrous. What matters is whether, for example, focusing on parties, as uh, Rick Pildes and I did in that article, the same party controls the presidency and Congress, or different parties control the presidency and Congress. 
when we have a Democratic president facing a Republican Congress or a Republican House of Representatives, we should expect lots of checks and balances and difficulty in acting legislation and impeachment charges and investigations. But when we have the same party controlling both branches of government, uh, then we should expect lots of cooperation and as anyone who pays attention to politics in Washington knows, that's exactly how things work. Uh, so when Donald Trump was president, Congress was not a reliable check on his power. It was only reliable to the extent that the Democrats had enough power to block his actions, get in his way. Uh, but Republican members of Congress weren't going to vote to impeach the president for the most part. So that's the basic insight that just like states don't always have incentives to fight or compete, branches of government and units of government don't always have incentives to be at cross purposes with one another. Sometimes they're on the same team. And is there a general lesson here about when we're trying to understand how decentralized cooperation and enforcement works? Is there a general lesson about the right level of generality of actor and any general guidance about how to ascertain the right level of generality of actor, or is it ad hoc? The general lesson, I think, is that we shouldn't attribute to states the personified notion that they have interests of their own or desires to maximize their own power or wealth or anything else. States are just vehicles for people to collectively accomplish things. And if what those people want to accomplish is better accomplished by cooperating with other states, by trading with other states, then that's what states will do. There's no third thing like a personified Leviathan that is pursuing its own interests apart from the interests of the people who make up the state. And the same is true of the branches of government. What the president will want to do, what Congress will want to do, what the courts will want to do depends on what the people who control those branches of government are trying to accomplish and where they're trying to accomplish the same thing, uh, then there won't be competition and warfare and checks and balances. So I think the general lesson is we should pay attention to the people, not to the institutions. Yep. And that's a general lesson, it seems to me, a central general lesson of the whole book. So talk about moving to a different lens. Talk about what constitutional law can learn from international law in thinking about accountability for wrongdoing, how we conceptualize accountability for wrongdoing, and should address accountability for wrongdoing. Because there's an analogous problem there. There's an analogous problem there, right. So the basic problem is when states do something bad, there's they're really hard to punish or sanction. <laughs> And that's because in an important sense, they don't exist in the material world. So international economic sanctions imposed on Iraq or Russia may immiserate the populations of those countries, but they don't have much effect on dictators like Saddam Hussein or Vladimir Putin uh, who can insulate themselves and their cronies. And you can launch missiles at a state in retaliation for something the state did, but the missiles are just going to pass through the material body of the state and land on innocent people. There's no way of punishing the state itself because the state itself is just a fictional construct. And that makes it difficult to know how to respond when states do bad things. Okay. I think the same is true in constitutional law. So for example, when we make the government pay damages for police brutality or other kinds of wrongdoing, the people paying those damages aren't the wrongdoers. And it's not the government or the state itself, whatever that would mean. It's taxpayers or more likely the beneficiaries of public schools or public housing or social services who would otherwise have gotten the money. So in both international law and constitutional law, what we're effectively doing is something like group punishment or collective responsibility. Uh, and there are moral concerns about, about whether that's the right way to treat people. And there are also instrumental concerns about when and how uh, launching missiles or taking money uh, away from citizens is going to prevent states from doing bad things going forward. Um, does that have doctrinal implications for things like damages actions against officers, 
qualified immunity, whether the state or the individual officer pays? I mean, what, how does that, how does that, what purchase does it have on those debates? Right. So those hot button debates about the procedural impediments to bringing lawsuits against police officers or local or state governments for, uh, for damages when constitutional rights are violated are, I think, uh, a little misplaced uh, because the premise there is that the more money we can make police officers or the government pay for wrongdoing, the less likely it is that the cops will stop doing horrible things. And I don't think that's necessarily true because it's not the police who are paying the money under any circumstances. It's not the individual officers who did the bad things who are paying the money in any circumstances. Those officers are always indemnified. And it's not the government that indemnifies them that's ultimately paying the money either. It's just passed through to taxpayers or defunded beneficiaries of public programs uh, and it's not clear that making those groups of people pay money uh, is going to create the same, the, create the kinds of political dynamics that would lead the government to behave better in the future. Okay, a third, a third mechanism for controlling state power that you talk about, you talk about the rights strategy. We're talking about constitutional law now, the rights-based strategy and the 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 voting or democracy strategy, and explain what those are. And those are typically thought to be alternatives or in tension with one another as ways of controlling the state. Right. So this is actually both international and constitutional law. Yeah. And both systems make use of the same basic regulatory strategies for controlling state power. You could call them rights and votes or legal rules and political influence. Uh, so this is international law on the one hand and then international relations on the other uh, which is about how states influence one another through the sort of political tools of diplomatic or economic or military power. In constitutional law, I think the equivalents are constitutional rules and rights, that's the legal side, and then representative democracy, which is the political side. Uh, so rights and votes, uh, common to both international and constitutional law, but there's an important difference, I think, in how internationalists and constitutionalists think of these regulatory tools. So international law and international relations have always been understood as continuous, interchangeable kinds of strategies for achieving the same ends, protecting ourselves from other states and trying to get them to do what we want, like the war in Gaza is being fought by soldiers and militias on the ground. It's being fought through channels of diplomacy in the courts of international law at the same time with the same goals. Uh, I don't need to say this on a lawfare podcast. Lawfare is the point. The continuity between legal and political methods of controlling states. Constitutional rights and votes, on the other hand, are usually conceived as opposites of one another. So rights are generally understood as trumps or impediments to democratic decision-making. We wring our hands over the counter-majoritarian difficulty of the Supreme Court imposing constitutional limitations on democracy. But I think the international perspective would be really illuminating for constitutionalists uh, if we look at constitutional rights and political democracy votes uh, as complements rather than substitutes, then that opens up a bunch of interesting questions about when constitutional law might prefer to use one or the other or particular combinations of both. So, for example, in the civil rights era, uh, is the right thing to do to invest in the civil rights movement on the streets, lobbying uh, Washington, President Johnson, politics, votes, or is the right thing to invest in litigation, Brown against Board of Education, liberal legalism? Martin Luther King famously said, give us the ballot and we'll no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. Give us votes and rights won't be relevant, but an interesting question of when we might want votes more than rights or rights more than votes or both. So in that example, and I think in every example we've discussed, one could characterize your book as about 
basically a how-to manual for what constitutional law can learn from international law and international relations theory. And it said that way, it's kind of a shocking thesis since constitutional law is meant to be the most sophisticated or one of the most sophisticated, theoretically sophisticated topics in law school and in law and international law has always been, you know, having to defend itself and somewhat less respected in the academy and the like. So is that a fair way? And is it true that constitutional law has a lot to learn from international law? Is that a fair way to, to understand the book? Yes, uh, that's absolutely what the book is supposed to convey. So the, the primary purpose of the book is to show constitutionalists who are really the target audience what they can learn from their internationalist counterparts. Uh, and I think internationalists have less to learn uh, in the other direction. But at the very least, they might take some satisfaction in con seeing constitutional law cut down to size because, as you say, constitutional law has achieved this exalted position as being not just real law, but like our highest and best form of law, whereas international law is dismissed as like fake or marginal. Uh, but I think actually international law has been, in many respects, way more sophisticated uh, about its own enterprise than constitutionalists have been. Was this, when you started to realize this 15 years ago, how surprising was it to you? And, and what was your reaction to it? Was this like an aha moment? This is great. Or, wow, I have to rethink what I think about international law. I mean, how did you think about this at first? Well, I think probably at first I thought it was pretty deflating uh, because it was easy to walk around the halls of Harvard and, and dismiss uh, people who were spending their lives thinking and practicing international law uh, as doing something that wasn't really law at all. It was, it was like some uh, sort of fake power politics uh, or lobbying or communication strategy or something like that. Uh, and then it probably dawned on me with some horror uh, that this is what I've been doing the whole time too. Your last chapter is kind of looking forward and it begins from the premise, I'm not sure how much you hold this premise, but it begins from the premise that state power is waning, that it's waning, that it's the power is descending below to private entities, corporations and other private entities, or that it's elevating above to global governance. So let's start off with the factual premise. Do, do you think that's true that the state is, state power is waning? No, uh, I don't. Uh, I myself think, and, and I know you think, recalling how the borderless sovereign internet that was supposed to do away with the state a couple decades ago still hasn't done so, mm -hmm. uh, as you described uh, in your book with Tim Wu, the death of the state has been greatly exaggerated. And if anything, in recent years, it seems like we're moving in the opposite direction, seeing backlashes against globalization, populist resurgences of nationalism, reassertions of borders against migration and against trade. It looks like the state is doing just fine for itself. And so this brings us back to something we didn't discuss at the beginning, but why was the state formed in the first place? Why has it been so persistent? Well, the state was sort of paradoxically originally created both for the purposes of war and for the purposes of peace. So Hobbes's state was supposed to end war. It was supposed to end the war of all against all in the state of nature, you know, at a theoretical level. But more realistically, Hobbes wrote Leviathan during a period of civil wars in England when he hoped that monarchical absolutism would put an end to the fighting by crushing uh, dissent and ending civil war. And this was also around the same time as the Peace of Westphalia was supposed to bring an end to the wars of religion that had been decimating Europe by creating a system of sovereign states that might peacefully coexist by leaving each other uh, alone. So one thing the state was supposed to do was by monopolizing violence and violence. At the same time, though, the state in its origins and development has always been a technology of warfare. It started uh, as a vehicle for kings to grow and extract wealth and manpower in order to build big armies that they could use to fight and defeat other states. In Charles Tilley's famous quote, war made the state and the state made war. 
Weber's canonical definition of the state is a governmental organization that lays claim to a monopoly uh, of legitimate violence within a territory, violence. And of course, today, everyone understands uh, that states are good at, among other things, fighting wars, mobilizing violence to cause lots of people to die, both uh, outside the state and within the state, thinking of Stalin and Hitler. So the state has this paradoxical quality that uh, it's a powerful technology of both good and evil. And the dilemma of state power is that the very same power and capacity of the state can be used for both good or evil to benefit citizens or to massacre them. So I agree with that. And let me ask you, this is not really something you address in your book, but it seems to me that the central idea that the state has this coercive, violent power that it can exercise within a territory. And we've talked about how it organizes itself to do that. That's a theoretical puzzle that you've gone a long way towards explaining. But this is a quality that, for lack of a better phrase, a well-functioning state possesses. And it seems to me that 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 ultimately coercive power within a territory is precisely why that ultimately corporations and private entities going downward and global governance entities going upward, why ultimately they can't be threats to the state because both of those entities, and and they've of course been challenges to what I'm trying to say, but they've never really succeeded. Those entities always fall prey to the coercive power of the state within the territory. Is Is that fair? I think that's a that's an accurate description of of the path of history up to now. There may be some exceptions. You know, the British East India Company had its own army, but generally, uh, the people who worry about the power of corporations and equate the power of you know multinational corporations or big tech uh, to the power of states are thinking that economic power can be as coercive and can have as large effects on people's lives as the violent coercive power of states and governments. Um, They're thinking that because states can use violence only to accomplish so much, they can't use violence to solve global collective action problems like global warming and war and terrorism uh, and pandemic disease, that there'll need to be some other governance mechanism created. And to the extent that governance system succeeds, the state will, despite its armies, uh, become decreasingly relevant to how the world is ruled. And from the bottom up, I guess what the people who believe that multinational corporations, Google, Amazon, are taking over the world think is that uh, because these corporations are so economically large and influential and have so much control over the lives of people, there'll just be limits to what government can do to them. And if uh, government tries to use its army and police force to coerce Uh, These companies, they'll just relocate to a different state uh, out of reach, and eventually they'll find a place uh, where they can do their own thing. Uh, Whether that's realistic or not is maybe an open question. Yeah. So just one last comment for me, and then you can react to it if you want. On the international level, there's no doubt that there are robust international governance structures that helps solve collective action problems. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of successful international laws that foster cooperation in so many contexts that are invisible to us. And they work through the mechanisms that you describe in your book, some combination of cooperation, the power of ideas, the distribution of power, sometimes coercion, all of those mechanisms that we know about from international relations. And there's no doubt that the nation states benefit hugely from these cooperative arrangements, whether it's, you know, trade, whether it's travel, every element of globalization, peace is secured, et cetera. There's just a million ways in which global governance works. I don't think one needs to see that as a threat to the idea of the kind of primacy of the state. Because you know these systems break down at times. They tend to break down when the the cooperative logic or the 
constructive logic no longer works for states. So I don't necessarily see attention there on, on the corporations and, you know, being able to locate that argument. I'm more skeptical of that, that argument, you know, private firms, sure they can move around. And yes, we see various firms at various times going quote unquote offshore to escape regulatory authority, but that strategy is hard if the major powers, the major markets want to assert dominion uh, over the corporations, because those corporations depend on international finance, international currencies, international trade, and the like. So I'm more skeptical of, of that as an ultimate challenge to the state. So any comments on anything I just said, disagreements? No disagreement. Uh, I think I think the, the reason I d- decided to write something about global governance and and multinational corporations wasn't that I believe that uh, these alternative leviathans really were going to supplant the state in any kind of comprehensive way. It was that they've, they've created problems of power that are probably going to be addressed in many of the same ways that constitutional law and international law uh, have addressed the power of states. So these new leviathans may not replace the old leviathans and they might not in crucial ways be as powerful as the old leviathans. Uh, but nonetheless, they're causing problems and threatening. And uh, when we think about how to control them, of course, our first resort is going to be to the power of the old leviathan with the armies uh, that can regulate. But in the view of many people, states haven't succeeded for whatever set of reasons in successfully regulating uh, global governance organizations, keeping them under control, and haven't succeeded uh, in regulating big tech in a way that makes people comfortable with the power of Facebook or Meta. Uh, And I think that's what's leading people to say, as Mark Zuckerberg put it uh, once, that his company behaves more like a government than a traditional business. Uh, and you can see why people have sort of sounded that kind of Leviathan alarm. You know, you, the Facebook user base is bigger than the population of China. Its revenues are greater than the GDPs of half the countries in the world. It conducts its own foreign policy. It controls speech and really all of human behavior using uh, data. It's a Leviathan. And now, uh, we see Facebook has law for Leviathan. It's got its own constitution and its own Supreme Court. And for those who might be inclined to dismiss the idea that Mark Zuckerberg is going to defer to an oversight body that he funds and appoints and whose decisions he's always free to ignore, I think we should ask the same questions of the president of the United States vis-a-vis the Supreme Court and constitutional law. Uh, so I think the analogies here, while highly imperfect, are nonetheless helpful in thinking about how we approach controlling power of Leviathan-like entities where we don't think uh, a super state or even a regular state is always fully up to the task. So I agree with all that. And This is my real final comment, but this has always been a feature of the state. I mean, the 16th and 17th century, the height of the so-called sovereign state, the post-Westphalian state, the the king never had absolute control. There were always competing power sources within the state. The church was a huge source of power that was often contrary to the king or the, the, the nominal sovereign and other power centers. And I think that the mechanisms you described for how those arrangements, those governance arrangements worked out applied back then. So I would just point out that there have, you know, there have always been other actors, even within sovereign states that have power centers that require governance structures and the governance structures tend to have worked the way you described them. Do Do you agree with that? I completely agree with that. So the state and the idea of the all powerful sovereign state has always been a myth or an ideal or a dystopian yeah. anti-ideal uh, or something like that. But you know, as a heuristic for thinking about how we want to organize power and how law can manage and control power, uh, it might still be kind of useful uh, to play with even the exaggerated version.
Daryl Levinson, thanks very much and congratulations on your great book. Thank you, Jack. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at www.lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your engineer this episode was Noam Osbond of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.